Today we're going to start a new topic and that's on complex numbers and imaginary numbers. <clears throat> so, to understand complex numbers, we need a new set of imaginary numbers. Now let's take a few steps back before we go into what the set of imaginary numbers is and how we define it and let's do a little history of maths. So <coughs> in early history people began to count because they wanted to count how many sheep they had, how many camels they had and so the system that the first numbers that people had were natural numbers. And so the set of natural numbers is um, given the symbol N and it contains all the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. Um, note that in the beginning of mathematics there was no zero. Then the um, people began to realise there was more numbers, they began to accept that negative numbers were numbers and the um, need for zero um, became apparent and that's when we get the integers. And these are all the numbers, negative numbers, zero, one, two, three, so forth, and so on and so forth, all the numbers that we count things with. <coughs> um, then, um, as pe people like Pythagoras, they began to realise we also had numbers that weren't numbers that we would count with, but we had fractions. And we had all these numbers that in between the one and the two, and the two and the three, and the zero and the one, that you could write as a fraction. And then we, so that brings us to um, rational numbers. Um, so these include one, they can half. Um, <coughs> but they also include numbers which can't be written as. Um, oh, yeah, no, these are, um, oh, these are the ones that, yeah, they can be. They have to be fractions, um, so we have 2 over 3, 1, 2, 3, so on, all the fractions in between those, and we get our negative equivalent, so we'd have minus like 3 over 2, minus 2, and so on and so forth. So there's our rational numbers, and they are given the denoted Q. Then we come to numbers that we use in counting, but they can't be written as in a fractional form. Um, and we call these real numbers, and these include irrational numbers. So these are the these are the rational numbers, but the set of real numbers which we call R, include irrational numbers. So we've still got our minus <coughs> numbers, but now we've got things like minus the square root of 2, um, minus 1, 0, half, um, 1, 2, 3, and we have things like pi in our set of real numbers. So it's all the other it's all the numbers that you're familiar with, that you've dealt with, and everything that you've ever done with maths is going to be sitting in this set of real numbers. However, in the 17th century, um this Descartes, Descartes came up with um, a collection of numbers 
called imaginary numbers. And some people took some <coughs> convincing that imaginary numbers were something that were actually valid. And these are denoted with the symbol I. <coughs> and um, we're going to be looking at what these actually are and what um, how we define them. So, imaginary, oops, Daisy, I need to bring out a new board. So, imaginary numbers are numbers that, when squared, give a negative value. So this seems really weird because we've learned if you multiply two negative numbers together you get a positive number. So this just seems so counterintuitive to everything you've ever learned. But the fact is that when you do a lot of maths, these very abstract um, things, these imaginary numbers, are solutions and valid solutions to a lot of real life problems. It's through imaginary numbers and complex numbers, which I'm about to define, that we um, have our mobile phone technology that um, allows um, us to generate fractals, and fractals are the basis for weather system um, analysis, so it's how we, we, we are able to um, give accurate weather forecasts is using a complex analysis. It's similar to earthquakes, um, though it's not as accurate as um, weather forecasting, we still use complex analysis in um, earthquake analysis and also in movies, um, the, the high quality um, computer generated imagery are all a result of complex numbers. So although we think multiplying two negative numbers is going to give us a positive number, this it just it, the thing is it works. So let's think about defining our complex <coughs> complex numbers. So the set of complex numbers combines real numbers with imaginary numbers. into a two-dimensional rather than one-dimensional number system. So I'm not talking, when I say one-dimensional, two-dimensional, we're not talking about um, like Cartesian coordinates, like the X and Y of an axis. What I'm thinking, what we're talking about here is, let's go back and just look at our, see our real numbers. <coughs> if you think about one, and then the real numbers will keep going in a straight line all the way to infinity, and they'll go in the straight line in the opposite direction all the way to negative infinity. That's a one-dimensional number system. Now what we're doing with complex numbers is we're adding another dimension to this and this will become clearer as we continue. Um, so Deska described the numbers in the set of complex numbers as 
as the sum of a real part plus an imaginary part. <clears throat> so this set of complex numbers is made up of a number which got a real part and you add on an imaginary part. So therefore this is how they're two dimensional. So this is one dimension and this is your second dimension. Complex numbers are represented as points on a plane rather than on a number line because of their two dimensional nature and we'll see that um, as we continue. So <clears throat> we need to define a new number. So we're going to introduce the number i and we define it's defined as i squared oops is equal to minus one. Therefore i is equal to the square root of minus one. So let's just we'll keep that up here so we can keep referring to this. Now it's to be noted that engineers, so if you do any engineering, engineer, engineers, oh, what have I written? Um, use J to denote square root of minus one because they engineers already have a, they'd already used the letter i for some other term in engineering so they use g um and we use we don't write we don't talk about the square root of minus one we just talk about i in the same way when you talk about pi you use the symbol for pi and we talk about e we use e so there's that you you, you already know of other numbers that we denote with letters. So let's consider this equation. x squared plus 1 equals 0. So let's solve it. x squared equals minus 1. So we would normally we say, oh that has no solution. But now we, we, we can get a solution because we have i is the square root of minus 1. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root of minus 1 which is plus or minus i. <coughs> now we can do some more examples. So let's think about the square root of 9. So we can just apply what we know about surge here. So we can rewrite this as 9 times minus 1. And that then becomes the square root of 9 times the square root of minus 1, which is... 3, and the square root of minus 1 is i. We can do the same with square root of 5. So that's going to be 5 times minus 1, which gives us the square root of 5 times the square root of minus 1. Now, we can't, there's no square root of 5, so that's just going to be left as a third i. Um, and finally, we have minus, oops, square root of minus 18. So let's rewrite <coughs> our 18. So that would be um, 2 times 9 is 18 times minus 1. So that gives us the square root of 2 times the square root of 9 times the square root of minus 1. So this gives us 3 root 2 i. Now, we really need, you, you need to be able to do this kind of manipulation without using a calculator. Um, some calculators do have an i function, um, a lot don't. And so don't rely on a calculator when doing this. Be able to understand it and do these um, for yourself. So now let's do a little bit more, um, things that are a wee bit more complicated. So let's look at, we want to simplify this expression.
So what does this mean? So it's 3i squared. So that's just going to be 3i squared. But this here is going to be 3 squared is 9. Oh, I don't put the squared here. And then i squared. Well, what is i squared? i squared is minus 1. So we're going to have minus 3 minus 9, which gives us minus 12. Um, what about oh, minus 8i plus minus 4i cubed. So that will give us our minus 8i just stays the same. And now we have here, we have, so what's minus 4 cubed is going to be, um, oops, I need to move my pen, minus 64, but then we're going to be timesing that by, so let's look at the i cubed. i cubed is i times i times i. So that's minus 1 times minus 1 times minus 1. Minus 1 times minus 1 is i squared. So that's just um, minus 1 squared times minus 1 squared is just going to be i squared, which is minus 1. Oops, never done that one. That's meant to be the minus 1 here. And then that's just going to leave us with this i here. So now we've got 64 times minus 1 i. So that's going to be plus 64. So it'll be minus 8 plus 64 i. And that then becomes 56 i. Um, now we have square root of 9i plus 16i over 4i. So we know 9 add 16 is going to be 25i over 4i. <coughs> and that then allows us to do um, so that's going to be the square root of 25 times the square root of i over square root of 4 times the square root of I and that then becomes well these the I's will cancel out because and then we'll just have the root of 25 over the root of 4 which is going to be 5 over 2 um, <coughs> and finally I to the minus 6 which is the same as saying I 1 over i to the power 6, and we can say, so our laws of indices tell us that that can be rewritten as i squared, then cubed. Now i squared is minus 1, and then that's going to be cubed, so this is just going to be minus 1. So I hope that makes sense.